Good evening, Quest teens. What's going on? Welcome. We're wrapping up our series on family titled Enough. Titled Enough. And hopefully you made it to a couple of our videos and, and uh, you haven't killed your family yet, you know, because family, we have that relationship with them, that up and down love-hate relationship. If there's anything that defines a love-hate relationships where you have seasons of love and seasons of, man, I don't like you too much. You're driving me crazy. Family is it. And we realize that the perfect love only comes through God and he sharpens us and molds us ultimately to look like him. So I want to end this series with a bang and I want to title this devotional, God's love is always enough. God's love is always enough. See, for the past couple of weeks, past couple, the past couple of devotionals, we've been looking at the teaching of an early follower of Jesus named John. See, John helps us uh, see that we have no debts to God's love except for the continuing debt to keep loving each other. He, John, believes that all love comes from God. I'm going to give you an inter uh, interesting statistic. The book of 1 John, the word love is mentioned 28 times. That's a lot. It's almost like the author, John himself, who was this close to Jesus, when it talks about the, 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 the disciple uh, who Jesus, whom Jesus loved, it talks about John. That's what the historians say. He's talking about John when he's mentioning that. So John knew Jesus personally, and he knew about the love of God, the love of Christ at a whole different level because he literally walked with Jesus. So it's not surprising to hear that he just emphasized love. He was the disciple of love, the apostle of love, because that's what he saw from Christ walking hand in hand with him. And he realized that honestly, without love, what are we? And he stresses that without love, not only love from God or loving God, but loving each other, without that, we don't have a case. We're not good believers. We're not living the way God, Christ, wants us to live. I want to jump to scripture, and it's out of 1 John. Chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. 1 John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. And I'm going to read. The subtitle says, God's love and ours. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. Verse 10 says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. I think he's getting a point across. Love, love this, love that, love this. That's all he's stressing. Because without love, what do we have? Without loving God and loving people, we're not living out the way God wants us to live. See, although vital, love, if we're honest, is not always easy. It's difficult. It's an intimidating word. It feels like, man, love seems like a different level of emotion, like holding somebody at a different level of, of a regard. We try to love others. Why? Because God first loved us. That's what John stresses here. He makes it clear. Our commandment to love is just following his footsteps that God first loved us. Remember John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The, the beginning of John 3, 16. At first, he first loved us. The Bible says, come closer to God and he will come closer to you. He first took that step. As an example of love, an example of love is in Jesus, the perfect, the perfect example, who was sent to show us what love looks like. Different type of love, sacrificial love, unconditional love. See, Jesus' love wasn't selfish. It wasn't like, you have to submit to me and that's just what it is. No, the Bible says he came to serve us. Remember, he said, I came to serve, not to be served. And that's interesting. It's a selfless type of love, which is almost the opposite of what we see in society. I want to be honest with you guys, man. The, the, the chips are stacked against us now because everything in society points to you. You have an Instagram, why? It's your page, your pictures, what you like, your thoughts, your opinions matters. Everything is about you, you, you. 
And unfortunately, when everything points to us, we think that everything is about us. And scripture lets us know, no, it's not only not everything is about you. It's about him. It's about God. It's about being selfless. It's loving others, even though sometimes they do things that make them not want to be loved. And if we're honest, sometimes we do things that you're like, man, how does God still love me? I just, I, just, I just heard a saying, a quote the other day, that it said that other people around you, some people are not going to like you because of speculation of, of things that they heard about you. Some people don't like you, like you and they don't even know you. They just speculate. They have these things in their head that, man, this person seems that way. They seem like they're this way. So they make up all these things in their head even before talking to you, and they make a judgment that they don't like you before even meeting you. Although people may speculate before they meet you that they don't like you, God loves you. Even though, he knows the, even, even though he knows the facts about you. That blew my mind. Like God loves you and even though he knows us. And if we're honest, sometimes we do things that yeah, you wonder how God still holds on to us. How God's love is that great towards us even though we sin, even though we fall short of his glory. And just like God forgave us and loves us, we're called to love and forgive others. That relationship is reciprocal. If we claim to love God, our attitude towards Everyone, I highlighted that word there. Our attitude towards everyone, including our families, should look like the love Jesus showed us. That's when it becomes difficult. It's easy to read, love this, love that, roses and flowers and purple and, and red hearts and the emojis and the little heart emojis and the smiley faces. It's easy to send that. It's easy to speak a good game, but it's really hard when somebody does something that you don't like, when something bothers you, when somebody betrays your trust when people fall short of your expectations of them and you still got to love them because God still loved you even though we fell short of his expectations and it's crazy and I'm not doing this to beat you up I'm doing this to make you smile that God still loves us even though we fall short of his glory the flip side is we got to go and do likewise we got to love others just the way that God loved us because if God would have gave up on us we would have been in big trouble he wouldn't have sent his son on the cross the way he did. And just like he didn't give up on us, let's practice not giving up on family that maybe does wrong to you, not giving up on people around you, friends, some people that maybe have fallen short of your expectations of them. God's love is enough because it's boundless, meaning there's no end to God's love. His love is unconditional, meaning that it can't be earned can't buy it. You can't bribe God. You're not going to tithe your way out of this. You're not going to give your way out of this. You're not going to just give to the poor to earn God's love. Although those things are great and, and, and necessary, that's not why God loves you. He loves you because he created you and he knows why he created you. With human love, it's easy to draw lines where our love stops, but that's not the case with God's love. This is a great place to start when considering hope and understanding in your family. It's a great place to start that God's love is limitless. It's unconditional. It's beside condition. It's regardless of the condition that you're in, he still loves you. Imagine looking at other people that way, that regardless of their condition. I mean, we all know people that maybe they were struggling at one point in their life or, or they didn't look like they were doing well or maybe they weren't doing well. And then maybe years later or months later, whatever it may be, you run into the same person or maybe you kept up with them and kept a relationship with them and they were totally different. Now they were successful, they were happier, they had money, whatever, whatever it may be, but it doesn't stop there. You know, you're not a finished product, we're not finished products, so let's not judge people according to where they're at. Let's maybe look at them through faith, through God's love, through a different lens of what they could be, of what God created them to be. And when we look at love that way, it changes the whole game selfless love, unconditional love. And it's so difficult sometimes because again, society sometimes stacks those chips against us. So my prayer is that we learn to practice this slowly but surely, maybe going against your natural inclination to hold a grudge. And instead of saying that, say, all right, God, you gave your life on the cross for me and for that person as well. Just like you loved me, I'm gonna love him or her. I'm gonna put my grudge aside and I'm gonna start loving my family. See, maybe you, I challenge you. Maybe you gotta pick the phone up right now and call somebody that you haven't talked to in a while. Or there was a disagreement a couple months ago and 
there was a grudge there and there's been an awkward tension in the relationship with somebody where you see them and, and it's awkward. I think we've all been in that situation, you know, where things are awkward and you don't know what to say. You can't make eye contact with the person. I challenge you to pick up the phone and text that person. Call them. Say, you've been on my heart. You've been on my mind. What's going on? How you been? Don't even bring up the situation that made you guys disagree, whatever it is. I think you'll be shocked that that person will be happy to hear from you, even if they don't say it. I challenge you to do that. I challenge you to go out to lunch with somebody you normally don't go out to lunch with. I challenge you to, to pray over the phone with the person that maybe has been driving you a little bit crazy. Man, I'm going to end with this. I remember a preacher saying that a lot of times we disagree with people and we have tension with them. And we pray about them, but we don't pray for them. It's interesting. We pray about people. Man, God, I wish you would do something about him or her. I wish you would get them away from me or, or whatever it is. And sometimes... Unfortunately, we might pray prayers that aren't the most positive. We might say, God, just, you know, strike that person down. I hope we don't pray that. But sometimes we get those negative thoughts because we're sinful people at times. And we get angry and we don't know how to react. And we bring that to God. But imagine praying for someone. Instead of about them and mentioning them, imagine praying for them. Saying, God, I don't know what's on his or her mind and, and they hurt me, but I think there's something deeper going on, Lord. I ask you to go into, go into their household, pray for them, Lord. Do something different for their family, for their heart, for their mindset, for their mental health, Lord. Something's not right. They're lashing out. I pray, Lord, that you just help them to uplift them. I rebuke any spiritual strongholds against them. See, that's praying for them. So my challenge is to pray for your family. Pray for your friends. Pray for each other, not just about each other. Let me pray as you get this month and the week going off the right way. Lord, I thank you so much for, for your love because you've loved us and you loved us so much, Lord, that you sent your one and only son to die on the cross for us. And I'm just extremely grateful and humbled by that. And just like you did that for us, we were called, Lord, to sacrifice for others, to put ourselves second. You came to serve and not to be served. And the, the, the student is not greater than his master, Lord. And just like you did it, we're called to serve those around us. Even when it looks like the chips are stacked against us, even if it looks like we got the short end of the stick, Lord, we're here to please and honor you, not men. And I pray for those struggling. I pray for those broken relationships, Lord, that maybe something, a disagreement got in the way of two people and they haven't talked and they haven't texted and they haven't spent time together. I pray, Lord, that that can change. That whoever listening to this, Lord, that that can change, that they can pick up the phone and call that person that they've been holding a grudge against, especially if it's family. We can't do it without you, Lord. And I thank you for your grace, love, and mercy. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Let's do it.